All right, we're still in chapter one of the book of Esther, and I'd like to begin reading in verse 13 and read to the end of the chapter. We're going to think about Vashti being deposed, Vashti deposed this morning. It says, then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment, and the next unto him was Karshina, Shether, Admather, Tarshish, Merez, Marcina, and Memucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king? Ahasuerus by the chamberlains. And Mamukan answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported the king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall we arise to much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published through all, throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small, and the saying, please the king. And the princes, and the king did according to the word of Memucan, he, for he sent letters into all the king's provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us this morning. So we see the setting aside of Vashti. And I just want to remind us, at least contextually, that when the king, in, in verse one, it says, then the king, the then connects us with what's gone before. And if you recall, the king was drunk. He, had, he was merry with wine and he called for the queen to come and basically show herself before all these drunken men uh, in this uh, uh, this banquet. And again, you think about what he was asking of his wife, what how unreasonable it would be to bring a woman into a group of men who are well oiled with wine and put her on display as some object. And she had, uh, for purposes of modesty, uh, maybe even emboldened by wine at her own party, had said no. And so the king wants to know, asking the wise men, how shall this be dealt with? How shall we deal with this? And again, we just need to uh, mention that um, sometimes when we, we do things in the moment of anger, Sometimes in, the, in a moment of anger, things are said that will cause much regret afterwards. And this is anger fueled by alcohol. And the king is, uh, in a sense, his ego is punctured uh, by her refusal to come. And he acts based on rising anger and ego that has been deflated somewhat. And he makes a decision that I suspect... Uh, that he would live to regret. And so it says, then the king said to the wise men, which knew the time. So if you remember, 
uh, the kind of parallel books that we think about at this time frame, uh, the Babylonian captivity. Uh, remember Daniel, he was one of these wise men. <clears throat> and so these Eastern kings surrounded them with these wise men. And these, these wise men, uh, they were astrologers who consulted the stars. They were involved in divination, all of these things. But they were like an advisory council to the king. And so uh, these men that knew the time, so for so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. So he surrounded himself with these experts uh, on all of these things, these advisors. In fact, you would say that it was almost like an inner council or a, a, a kind of a cabinet, like of a prime minister, but a but an inner uh, cabinet. So it says, <clears throat> and next unto him was Karshina, uh, Shether, Admatha, Tarshish, Meres, Marcina, and Mimucan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face. So again, they had they had access to the king. Uh, without him having to put the scepter down, they had access to the king's presence. They were his advisors, uh, close advisors. They saw the king's face, and which sat the first in the kingdom. And uh, again, remember, uh, Daniel uh, was put in that kind of a position, if you remember, uh, when Darius the Mede uh, <clears throat> appointed him in that way. So I want to just think about these seven men in this council, because I do believe that there's a mention of them uh, elsewhere uh, in the book of Ezra. If you look at Ezra chapter 7, Ezra chapter 7 and verse 14, just back a few pages, it says, For as much as thou art sent of the king and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand. So again, we see that the, the king was surrounded by his seven counselors. So he's asking these men what advice they would give. Of these seven, uh, we'll see Mamukin seems to be the spokesman because we see in verse 16, the Q Mamukin answered, and then in verse 21, and the saying, please the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mamukin. So he's clearly the spokesman of this group. So the question is, what shall we do to the queen Vashti? Verse 15, according to the law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains, because she refused to come uh, to this drunken banquet uh, and display herself before these men. And so verse 16, Mamukin answered. Now, I want you to notice that what Mamukin does is he, he exaggerates the impact of what Vashti has done. And he said, this is, this is not just her. This is going to trick the trickle down effect is going to affect the whole empire, all 127 provinces, all the kings. In other words, he blows it up out of all proportion uh, and really makes it to be a huge thing. Uh, it's quite a wily plan. So Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes, to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. And if you notice the word all there, in other words, what she has done is of massive importance. It affects everybody and therefore it needs to be dealt with. Now, again, uh, I, I think it's like over-exaggerated, but and, I, and the reason I say that is, um, do you think that any other woman in the whole of the 127 provinces of the Persian Empire had a mind of her own? <laughs> uh, I suspect there were a few ladies that had a mind of their own, right? And so what he, he's saying is this is this going to affect everybody? Well, uh, like this is this is more like reality and normality. Right, their ladies have a mind of their own, and uh, so that was that, that's kind of to keep that in the back of our minds. But he is stressing this is this has disastrous consequences for every household. Verse seventeen: For this deed of the queen shall come abroad to all women. Notice again the emphasis on all. It, it's just he's saying this is it's going to affect everybody, all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported 
the king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti, the queen, to be brought in before him, but she came not. And again, you might ask, even at the banquet, how many of the men at the banquet had wives that had a mind of their own? I'm sure there were a few. And yet uh, this deed is affecting all. There's, a, there's tremendous consequences to it in this exaggerated view of Memucan. It says, likewise shall, all, shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, there's that word all again, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. This is, this is what the result is going to be. It's going to have devastating consequences trickling down to every household in the whole of the empire. And so what's his solution? He says, if it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered. And if you remember from the book of Daniel, one of the great emphasis is on the inferiority of the silver kingdom uh, in the, the, the head of gold, the king could do what he wanted and he was accountable to no one in his mind. Of course, he's still accountable to God because uh, those uh, kings and all of these people are, are God's servants and will give an account to him. But in his mind, he's not accountable to anybody. Whatever he, the king says, it goes. When you come to the Medo-Persian Empire, it was a constitutional monarchy. In other words, when something was written into the law, even the king had to abide by the decision. Once, it, once something was in law, it couldn't be changed. It was, uh, was put in, set in motion, and even the king himself could not go against it. And so what they want this to be is uh, just like this, a command that would be irreversible. And you can imagine why they would want this. If they successfully depose Esther... Oh, sorry, Vashti. And if the king changed changed his mind, what would be their plight? Right, the king is now back in uh, the queen is back in power again. It's going to look bad for them. So they want to make sure that when this is done, there's no way that there's any comeback. Nothing's going to affect them. And so uh, this law of the Persians and the Medes that it be not altered. And so what is the law? That Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, banished, as it were, from the king's presence. Let the king give her royal estate to another that is better than she. And so replace her completely. Another queen that's better than she is, uh, remove her out of the way. And when the king's decree, which he shall make, shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great. Again, not only are they exaggerating the issue, but buttering up the king by talking about how great the empire is so that he feels uh, the sense of power and his own importance. Remember, his ego has been punctured a little bit by uh, Vashti's refusal. And so published throughout all the empire, for it is great. All the wives shall give their husbands honor, both to great and small. And again, we have to ask the question, can legislation actually make somebody do something contrary to their will and disposition? All the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both great and small. In other words, from now on, this is going to solve all the problems. We just bring a new law in, it's going to solve everything, and it's going to make the, all the wives uh, give great honor to their husbands. Well, it's not the way it works, right? Law doesn't change the heart, or it doesn't change the home either. And, and so, and again, the, the in, inability of law to bring changes and I think that's a very significant thing. We need to recognize that law can't, it can't, you know, again, in our culture, there are laws that have been passed to help us to accept things that the Bible clearly condemns. And it doesn't matter how many laws that pass, it's not going to change the mind of a child of God who's convicted by the word of God. He's not going to change his opinion. He's going to stand for the word of God. 
right? So it doesn't matter what the law says. If it says I'm supposed to accept all these, uh, I can't. I can't condone what God has condemned. And so law is incapable of making these changes. Uh, would the decree make wives love their husbands more? No, it wouldn't. Uh, in fact, the New Testament has such a better solution. What it says is, if we want our wives to be submissive and respectful, it says, here's the way to do it. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. And so if a husband really loved his wife like Christ loved the church, he wouldn't expect her to parade uh, before a bunch of drunken uh, lechers who are wanting to look at her. That, that's not a loving way a man would work, right? He wouldn't do that. And so, uh, again, we just see uh, the New Testament solution is so much better than more legislation. And yet, tragically, many Christians feel like if we can just change the legislation, we'll change the hearts. Well, we certainly don't want the government to be involved in things that are contrary to God. And we would like to have better legislation. But ultimately, nothing will change this continent other than the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes the hearts of men. That alone will bring lasting change because it will get to the core of the problem, the heart of the problem. And the heart of the problem is the heart. It's the very heart of man. And only the gospel can change the heart. And so it says, when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, the wives shall give to their uh, husbands honor, both great and small. And the saying pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mabukin. And so the king goes ahead with this. Now, again, we're going to see uh, that he's going to live to regret this decision. Uh, but at this mo moment, he, he's, he, again, he's, he's angry. Uh, his, his ego's been punctured, and he's still well-oiled with liquor. And so he goes along with the, uh, the council's decision, and he, he, of course, signs the document that they've draw up, and it says, notice verse 22, for he sent letters into all the king's provinces, to every province according to the writing thereof, to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Now, several interesting things about verse 22. The first one is that um, history tells us that the Persian Empire had a magnificent postal system. And so what they would do is, it's kind of like the, uh, the old Pony Express in the United States. They would have uh, a horse and, and a rider, and he would ride for one day, but they would always, at one day's length, have another fresh horse and fresh rider so that they could get these messages, uh, whatever it, the decree was about throughout the empire in sufficient time. So it would be passed on to the next one. He would ride his horse for a day and there'd be another fresh horse and rider and that way this would get to all 127 provinces uh in uh, good time and so this was this was how the system worked and, and again there's a lot of uh, historical documentation to prove this that they had an excellent uh, postal service the persian postal service and uh, i'm not sure they made a profit but they certainly got their mail delivered to the right places and so it's sent and again it's according to it says to every province according to the writing thereof and again remember this is going it's from from india to ethiopia the vastness of the empire several languages now there is a language that is spoken in the empire like a like a, a business language a, a court language which is what we call aramaic that was spoken throughout the empire as the common language, but there were still original languages. And it's kind of interesting because in the New Testament, remember, there's a lot of Aramaic words that have come into the Hebrew language, and a lot of people speak Aramaic, and it's because of the time in the Persian Empire. They picked up that language and brought it with them, and so you see quite a number of Aramaic words in our New Testament. And so it, they're uh, 
everybody gets the message in their own language. So it was obviously translated uh, into the various languages of the different provinces. And then it says to every people after their language that every man should bear rule in his own house and that it should be published according to the language of every people. Now, there's some thought here that uh, what is not only not only given it in everybody's language, but what he's saying is that in every household, the, there'd be a lot of mixed marriages in the empire. People of different languages and the when the man's language uh was different to the wives it should be the man's language that prevails and so when every man bears rule in his own house it should be according to his language and so it was a an attempt again to emphasize the male dominance that the language that should be spoken uh, should in the household must be that of the men. Now, let's just just go back again, please, to the book of Nehemiah, and we can see that this certainly was considered a problem uh, in Nehemiah's day uh, when the language of the the father, especially in a mixed marriage situation, Nehemiah thir uh, thirteen verse twenty three and twenty four, we read this. And in those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters to their sons, and nor take their daughters to your sons or for yourselves and what he saw was the danger uh, one of the dangers of these intermarriages and of course there are a lot of dangers that are highlighted in the scriptures when a child of god marries outside of the people of god right so in in the old testament when a jew married somebody from a gentile background one of the difficulties was a language difficulty the children may not grow up speaking the Hebrew language. And the difficulty for that was in those days, the scriptures were only available in the Hebrew tongue. So that's undermining the ability to understand the word of God. So that's a serious thing, as well as uh, the more common thing we think of. And that is that when a man marries somebody who's not part of the house of God, uh, that he will, uh, his wife potentially could draw his heart away from God to worship the gods of her background. And of course, you see that again and again in the uh, Old Testament with Solomon and other kings as well. So certainly this uh, was considered to be problematic. And so now there's this decree going out. We want the women to submit to their men. Here's an example of what's going to happen. Uh, to somebody that dares to challenge male rule in the household and the men must speak their language and make their language the priority in the household so it raises a, an interesting question about the fate of Vashti and the rabbis uh, their uh, take on this is that she was executed and certainly that would fit with the way eastern monarchs uh, dealt with things uh, so that there's that's a, a possibility but again scripture doesn't tell us it doesn't detail other than the fact that she was deposed and other than the fact that in her deposed condition she had no more access to the king and her any wealth or any estate that was hers was forfeited and so that's what scripture tells us. Others go a step further. We don't know for sure if that's true. I suspect that it would not have happened immediately. And the reason I suspect that is I think Vashti may have lived somewhat longer. Um, it's interesting, too, that Artax Xerxes, uh, who would become the next king, was considered to be the, the son of Vashti. Uh, at least historians would tell us that. And so... Uh, certainly she would ultimately have 
influence uh, in through her son. But I want you to notice now when we go into chapter two, we get this simple simple statement after these things, when the wrath of King Ahasuerus was appeased. Now, this phrase after these things tells us actually this. It took a long time for his anger to be abated and for him to cool off. And we know that because if you look at chapter 2 again and verse 16, chapter 2, verse 16, it says, So Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the 10th month, which is the month Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Okay, seventh year of his reign. Now look back to chapter one of Esther and verse three and the timing of the banquet. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast to all his princes and his servants and the power of Mer Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before them. So what we can clearly see is there's a four year gap between Esther being made queen and the banquets that would result in the uh, Vashti being deposed. And so we might ask ourselves, well, what about these intervening years? Why was there this long delay? And the answer is, is very simple. Uh, there was what we call the Greek campaigns that he had been, remember he'd been, the reason he'd been having these banquets was to get everybody on his side to attack Greece. And that's what happens in the intervening section. Between chapter 2 and chapter 3, there are some military campaigns that take place, and they were disastrous. And uh, again, history will tell us, if 480 BC, there was a naval de defeat at Salamis, where much of the Persian navy was destroyed by the Greek sailors. And then that was followed by further humiliation in a place called Plataea in 479 BC, where the, the forces of Greece overcame a much larger force of the Medo-Persians and left them in disarray. And so the king comes back from this, this failed campaign. He's, he's looking for some consolation after the disaster of this campaign. And perhaps, who do you talk to when you've had a difficult experience? Well, it would be nice to go home to the wife and get some sympathy and a bit of commiseration. But he can't do that because he's deposed his wife. And so it says, after these things, did King Ahasuerus promote, I'm looking at the wrong verse, it's chapter, chapter two. After these things, this is chapter two, verse one. When the wrath of the king, of King Ahasuerus was appeased, he remembered Vashti, and what she had done and what was decreed against her. So he comes back, his wrath has been appeased. Uh, it's kind of interesting, the word appeased. It's, this, it's the same uh, root word of when Noah's ark, after the, the ark, in, in, back in the book of Genesis in chapter 8 and verse 10, it says the waters were assuaged, or the waters, as it were, receded after the flood right that's the that's the same very same root word here the waters were assuaged and so his anger which was risen to a high degree because his ego was affected in front of all these men his his anger had now kind of calmed down it and now settled down and it says he remembered vashti remember she was beautiful and she had been his wife and he remembered her and and of course he also remembered what she had done and what was decreed against her, which meant 
he wasn't, according to the law, the Medes and the Persians, which changes not. He couldn't reverse the decision. And he couldn't say, sorry, honey, I, I, I had too much to drink. And I said things I shouldn't have said. And I asked something of you I shouldn't have asked. And it's too late. It's into law now. And so the king is pretty low in many ways. Low because of defeat. Low because of no one there to comfort him after this, this humiliating defeat. And so what happens next? Well, it says, then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And so the suggestion is, let's have a royal beauty pageant. <laughs> let's get all the beauties of the empire together and we'll have a, 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 a Miss Persia competition. And the one that looks best uh, and that you like the most, she can become queen. And the rest of them, you can just add to your harem because there's no going back. And so this was the suggestion. And uh, I guess this suggestion seemed pretty appealing to the king who's lonely after his uh, the de de deposition of his wife. And so it seems like an interesting thing. Now, before we go into all the details here, I want to make a piece of application uh, about the former section that we just studied uh, from verse 13 onwards. And the, the application is very simple. And that is when Vashti was set aside, a Gentile bride was set aside for failing to show her beauty to the world. And after that, a Jew replaces her and goes to a place of prominence. Now, prophetically, we can see by way of application that ultimately at the end of this age, the church age, the church, which is the bride of Christ, because it will become more and more apostate towards the end, will fail miserably to show its beauty to the world. And eventually, God is going to, through the rapture, going to set aside the church in his dealings, they'll be eternally his bride and the object of his affection. But Israel is going to come to the prominence again. And he's going to take up his dealings with the nation of Israel. So that's kind of a, 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 a kind of an interesting way to apply this. And of course, let's apply it personally. Am I showing the beauty of being part of the bride of Christ? to this world? <laughs> Am I properly displaying the loveliness of that heavenly man who is the lover of my soul on a day-to-day -day basis? Do, can people see something of the, the reflected beauty of Christ in my life? And if not, uh, we need to recognize that this is the, as we get to the end of the age, the church is going to become more and more apostate. The second Timothy three, it almost reads like Romans chapter one, but the tragedy of 2 Timothy 3 is that it's the sphere of profession, professing themselves. <laughs> they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And so that's a tragedy, isn't it? That at the end of the age, the church will not be what it ought to be. So... <clears throat> We notice then in verse two, then said the king's servants that ministered to him, let the fair young virgins be sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace, to the house of the women, unto the custody of Higi, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women, and let their things for purification be given them. Uh, several things to say here that the fact that he's appointing officers and they're going to all the districts and, okay, who's the most beautiful girl in this town? Okay. And then when they found her, okay, she's coming. And maybe they had some stipulations. Maybe the king had said, well, you know, I wanted to, this is what she's supposed to look like. I don't know how much stipulation, but Josephus tells us 
in his uh, kind of a commentary on this event, he said that there were 400 that were chosen for this beauty pageant out of all the empire. So they all must have been particularly stunning ladies. And I'm sure that some of them being dragged away to a very uncertain future from their home and their family must have lamented the fact that they were born so beautiful. Maybe they thought, oh, if only I would have been a plain Jane. Sorry if anybody's married to somebody called Jane or anybody. It just, it just rhymes, that's all. But, but maybe that was the thought, uh, you know, uh, if only I hadn't have been so comely, so beautiful, because you wouldn't have been chosen. And so they bring these uh, 400 women to the palace. And then there's this period of uh, purification. Uh, and uh, it was considered to be a 12 month period. And uh, they were, uh, the word purification comes from a word that means to scour or to polish. And so the idea is they were going to be really cleaned up and, of course, made pretty uh, in every way. They're all going to look like models, you know, um, as they parade before the king. So the idea is to really emphasize uh, their cleaning up and their making beautiful. And let the maiden which pleaseth the king be queen instead of Vashti. And the thing pleased the king. And he did so. So this prospect of 400 virgins looking beautiful and then he gets to pick whichever one and uh, again some would suggest that uh, he would uh, during the 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 time frame uh, he, he he could pick whichever ones he wanted and 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 still decide no she's not the one for me or whatever but anyway uh, the, the very idea pleased the king uh, he's kind of, it's brought him out of his dumps. He's, he's no longer <laughs> uh, down in the dumps. He's got this prospect of, of this to look forward to. And so at this point, we're introduced to some of the key characters in the story, Mordecai and Esther. And so it says in verse 5, now, in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew. Now, interesting, a certain Jew. Now, it tells us the same verse, he's a Benjamite. And so normally, we would think of the word Jew being somebody from the tribe of Judah, right? That's how it would have been used prior to the captivity, okay? It would, it would identify somebody from the tribe of Judah. But after the captivity, the term Jew meant anybody who was part of the 12 tribes of Israel, basically. And so it became a blanket kind of word that covered them all. And so, uh, for instance, when, when Hitler uh, decided that he was going to exterminate the Jews, he wasn't just thinking of the tribe of Judah. He wanted every uh, descendant of Abraham uh, through Isaac and Jacob to be wiped out. So it became used in a term much more general than we think of it today. So in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. Now again, Mordecai, his name is from the Babylonian Marduk, the Babylonian god Marduk. And if you remember in the book of Daniel, one of the first things these captives, when they were taken into captivity, and we were going to have a reprogramming of them, and many of their names were connected to, to God. Uh, you certainly see that in the book of Daniel. And so we, we don't want them thinking of their gods. We want to think of the Babylonian gods because our gods defeated your gods. You know, And of course, the book of Daniel, the whole point of the book of Daniel is the most high God rules in the kingdoms of men. But they didn't think that way. They thought, since we've defeated Judah, and uh, therefore we, our gods, are superior. So we changed their names. So M Mordecai uh, was given this name after Marduk, uh, the Babylonian god. We're not told what his, his uh, Hebrew name was, but when it comes to Esther, 
we get both. We get her Hebrew name and we also get uh, her name that associates her with the empire. And so Mordecai, and then it, it says the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Now there's a, a lot of discussion about this little geneal genealogical record here. Is it is it saying that uh, he's a di direct descendant of these individuals who may not have been the uh, the uh, Kish, who was the father of Saul, that we think of Shimei? We think of the one remember who was a, again a descent a Benjamite who cursed David when he crossed. Uh, the, um, the brook Kidron uh, and fled from Absalom. So the, so the question is, is because you see, if, if it was directly related, um, then it, it, to these individuals, it would make Mordecai at least 120 years old. It was, it goes back too far. So, so it, it's not, it, it can't be, this is the direct descendancy. So what one suggestion, and this is the one that I like the most, is that Mordecai, the son of Jer. So Jer was the one, verse 6, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away by Jeconiah, king of Judah. And that would be the father of Mordecai, who was carried away captive. But then he says... He's telling us some of the, the the important people that were in his genealogy. He's not giving us the whole genealogy, but he, he is saying that in his genealogy of this fellow Mordecai, well, there's a connection with Kish, who was the father of Saul. And there's a connection with Shimei, who, again, was very obviously very loyal to Saul when he cursed David when David crossed the river. So it, these are the famous ancestors. And the thought is this, that Esther had royal connections through the house of Saul. When we get further down in the story, and this is why I think this is very interesting, Haman was an Agagite. And the thought is that he was connected to Agag, remember King Agag that Saul should have killed and Samuel hacked to pieces. Remember, he was an Amalekite. So the thought is that this old rivalry between Saul and Agag, the Amalekites, is now being replayed during the captivity. That we've got Mordecai, who's a direct descendant of the royal family through Saul, and then you have this other uh, man, Haman, who is directly connected to Agag. So it's like the old scores need to be settled. Old wounds need, need to be healed. We're going to put this right. And you know, you know sometimes that there are family feuds that go on for generations. You know, the the famous, uh, I guess, in the U.S., Hatfields versus the McCoys, and I don't know anything about that, but I know that it's a. There was a big feud that went on for a long, long time. Well, there's some thought that that's uh, what we're getting here is is kind of setting the scene for what's to come. This Mordecai, his connections, put him back in proximity of Saul. When we get to Haman. His connections put him back in proximity of Agag. And there's at least the thought of getting even for what had happened in the days of Saul. So it says he'd been carried away, uh, verse 6, from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And then it says... In verse 7 of great significance, he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So Hadassah has the idea of myrtle. 
uh, it's a, it means myrtle and uh, it's again the hebrew name of esther uh, and because myrtle uh, we read about uh, the horses among the myrtle trees in the book of Zechariah, and they, they tend to grow in a low place. And so it has the idea of humility uh, with it too, and beauty. Uh, it's wonderful. in this parts of the U.S. where they have crepe myrtles, and they absolutely look gorgeous in the springtime when they're in bloom. So it's a beautiful tree, and it's humble as well. So that's kind of a nice picture of, of what Esther name means and perhaps uh, often name and character uh, seem to go together and so something of the, her beauty and her humility is seen here and of course you see that as she submits willingly uh, throughout the story to uh, her adoptive uncle and so he brought up Hadassah that is Esther now Esther is it literally has the idea of star but it's again derived from the goddess Ishtar or in Hebrew it would be Ashtoreth and so again there's a there's a pagan deity connection in her name and it tells us that um, she was an orphan and this is what's so remarkable remarkable about this story is is uh, and just try and think of it in modern day terms i want you to just imagine this imagine an, a jewish orphan being crowned queen of present day iran it would be hard for us to even begin to fathom that right but here she is she is going to become this jewish orphan girl just as uh, vashti's fall was swift we're going to see the esther's rise is going to be meteoric you know this jewish orphan is going to be the queen of a, an empire of 127 provinces it's just remarkable to even think of it and it's amazing as well to think that in a coming day the descendants of mordecai and esther the jewish people who are so despised and often being called the heel of the nations, uh, they're going to become the head of the nations in a coming day. And men will grab hold of the skirt of a Jew and say, tell me about your God. <laughs> so God is good at doing big reversals. It's good to be aware of that. And so it tells us about her. It says um, not only was she orphaned, and she had been taken in by Mordecai uh, as a result of her losing her parents. But it says she was fair and beautiful. And some have suggested the idea she, she was lovely, both in her form and her features, everything about her. She was a very lovely person, lovely to look at, lovely in personality, lovely in character. And certainly we see that she's constantly brought into favor with people as we go through the book. She was, she clearly was a very beautiful woman. And the thought is that they actually were cousins, although Hebrew tradition and Josephus say he was her uncle. But either way, um, he takes her in, obviously is older than her, takes her in and uh, raises her as his own daughter, took for his own daughter. And so verse 8, it says, so it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan, the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house, so the custody of Haggai, uh, keeper of the women. And again, you've got to ask yourself, like, why would would Haman, um, if it was a voluntary action, have given his adopted daughter to become part of the harem of a pagan king who has a huge temper? You know, this is, this didn't look like a good move, and I, I suggest to you that he didn't have any choice. That again, the king's appointing officers 
um, that what could you do when they came around? And of course, with Esther having such a reputation for being beautiful, both in her looks and her character, uh, all they would do is go into a community and say, well, you know, who, who are the who are suitable candidates uh, for the king? Who would be beautiful enough to become the queen? And straight away, the name would come, oh, Esther. She's a real beauty. And so I, I suspect that Mordecai I didn't have a lot of options here. And so she's taken into custody. But we notice in verse 9, it says, and the maiden pleased him and she obtained kindness of him just like joseph and daniel these great stories of men who always seem to find favor amongst gentile circumstances and so found favor in foreign courts and uh, she uh, like joseph like daniel and again, we got to we got to remember. Uh, we said it's very important for us to see this that uh, the the God is not mentioned, but the finger of God is everywhere. I got another quote on that this uh, this week from Mister Darby. It said, "God's ways are behind the scenes, but He moves all the scenes which He is behind." Let me say that again. That was lovely. God's ways are behind the scenes, but he moves all the scenes which he is behind. And so we've got to see the hand of God in this. We're going to see how significant it's going to be having Esther in this place. It's going to be, well, again, God has brought her to the kingdom for such a time as this. And again, we got to we got to see, and it's a wonderful thing to see. And, and that's the big big takeaway from the Book of Esther, is it's wonderful to be conscious of the overriding providence of God in history. If we didn't believe that, it would be very hard to live in this world. We would be in despair as we look at our culture and our civilization literally imploding. And we would say, Lord, this is what's going on here. But we recognize the providence of God that he's able to, as we see, we often re say it, he's able to make the wrath of man to praise him. Well, in this book, we're going to see that over and over again. The wrath of the king in deposing Vashti. God's going to use that <laughs> to cause us to praise him. Uh, we're going to see the wrath of Haman going to see that very clearly but god is going to use that to cause us to praise him and god is able to make the wrath of man to praise him and it's wonderful to be reminded of these truths so the maiden pleased him and she obeyed uh, sorry and she obtained kindness of him and he speedily gave her her things for purification with such things as belonged to her and seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of women and so basically she gets the red carpet treatment she gets the best of the best you know when we're going to get this lady ready she's going to have all the best beauty treatments all the best things that are available in the empire is going to be given to her and it's again just an interesting contrast here that Esther um, makes no mention of Jewish dietary laws. In fact, we're going to see in the very, uh, very next verse, um, she's being charged not to even identify her Jewishness. So unlike Daniel, who wouldn't defile himself to eat the king's meat, she's getting pagan food every day, right? So it's just interesting to see. Uh, and again, we said that the characters in the book of Esther they're not really living fully for the Lord. They didn't have a heart to go back when the opportunity to go back to Jerusalem and help with the work there, they didn't go. And they're clearly not taking stands uh, up to now anyway about things that people in former generations took a stand on. So we're not talking about the most spiritual people 
but they're still God's people. And that's the encouraging thing, that he is going to protect and preserve them, even though they're away from him. Isn't that amazing? That even when we're not walking like we should be, even though we know the Lord chastens, but nevertheless, he doesn't stop loving us. He doesn't stop watching out for us. He still cares for his own. The other day, I was looking out of the apartment window and I saw three sparrows. They were just hopping around and I couldn't help but be re being reminded about the Lord and his love for his own. And he said, does not one sparrow fall to the ground and your heavenly father doesn't know it. And isn't it wonderful that he really does care about us and he's the God of the details. And so our time is gone, but may the Lord encourage us as we have considered some of the, the ups and downs uh, in the book of Esther. Amen.